Uh, all right. Well, welcome back to Audiophiles Anonymous podcast episode. I don't know. Help me out, Seincraft. Four? Episode number four. four. So this is kind of a new episode, kind of a continuation of our conversation about flagships that we had last time. That was We called it like flagships part one, but honestly, it's been like a month ago, so it's kind of like <laughs> this is part two, and this is more of a a value oriented conversation about like, and we can start talking about flagships and the value we think they bring to the table, but then, you know, maybe we'll work our way down through some of the, the cheaper price ranges and talk about how we think value stacks up there. We've already, if you haven't checked it out yet, uh, Seincraft and I, we did, uh, a couple of episodes ago, we did like price picks or headphone picks in a lot of different price categories. So I think we both felt that those were good value options for where they were at. So that might be something you want to check out too. We can link that um, in the description as well. So uh, sign, why don't you start off? Like, what do you value perspective? I don't know, maybe just thoughts around it to begin with, and then maybe talk about, you know, I, you're so, you're a Sasvara guy, so you could talk about maybe the value there. Oh yeah, Put and we can spot. talk about some of the other <laughs> some of the other high end stuff that we've tried and and where we think all that stuff stacks up value wise, and then maybe yeah, work our way down a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sounds good. I think we were talking last time a little bit about about what's the purpose of flagships in the yeah. market, right? Because this, this is a very small, um, you know, strata of headphone junkies that both have the interest and the willingness and the ability to spend the kind of money that a, that a flagship, you know, a, a true flagship headphone costs. I mean, these are usually north of, I think, I don't know if our definition was like north of two grand or north of 2,500 bucks, or just at least the top of the line of a thing that is made by, you know, a manufacturer. Yeah. I mean, I think we were saying probably at least around 2000, but then we talked about like the 800 the HD 800, which I'm using at 8XX right now, which I think is a wonderful value, but yeah. I'll I'll save that for a little bit later. But um, the the best thing a company makes just to show off what they can do, right? Really. And so, what's the point there, right? If like if you're only going to sell a handful of these, like that's not necessarily good business, right? If you're strictly looking at unit economics and the cost of manufacturing, setting up tooling, a production line, quality assurance, dealing with return, like it's it's not like on its face value a very good way to make money. Um, it, it, no. But a lot of manufacturers rush into the space, and, and it's not that they're not. They're not doing this out of the goodness of their heart, right? They are making money, and and that's the point of sort of the, the, the cost-to-value ratio at this upper end. And it's the same thing if you look at, you know, supercars or hypercars or whatever. It's like it's law of diminishing returns, right? You're not getting – a 100x better performance, you know, out of a million dollar Ferrari <laughs> than you are out of a, you know, $10,000 Susie, you're, you know, you're falling very rapidly off that, off that, um, diminishing return cliff, but, but still why, why do all these companies, you know, do this? And it's, it's a chance to sort of, uh, to explore new spaces and to put new technologies into the market and to try to figure out, you know, what's next for them and their brand and, 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 uh, the audience. Well, and we're talking a lot of times, too, we're talking from a consumer listener perspective, too, of what the value of these things are. But maybe that's the wrong way to think about flagships, honestly, because I've been talking with a with an amp designer lately a little bit and um, just he's got some new stuff coming out. And we've been talking about, you know, value and we've been talking about, you know, just why different amps are made. And so. I think too, like it's hard to put a value on like the learning experience of creating something that's like the pinnacle of what you can achieve, right? Like I think for a lot of these, a lot of these manufacturers, the flagships are passion projects more than anything, right? They want to know what's the absolute best yeah. they can make, and then they try to figure out how to market it later, right? Well, but yeah. I think, I think at the core though, it's really just like I want to make the best. Yeah. And that, like, how do you put a value on that, really? I mean, I mean, it's it's R and D, right? It's like it's research and development, and you know that for every flagship we see, there are tons of other crazy ideas, you know, sitting in a lab somewhere, uh, in the headquarters of that company that never see the light of day, because you know, for one reason or another, they have some inherent performance flaw, they are un undrivable by reasonable technology, they, um, you know, they're hard to commercialize. I mean, that's the thing too. Uh, a flagship actually has to leave the lab 
go in a nice velvet covered box and arrive at somebody's doorstep. Whereas like pure R and D never has to do that. So if you think of the strata from like what's possible to what consumers get, right? There's this whole other strata of stuff we'll never see, right? Unless That's maybe true. we get the behind the scenes tour. That um, would be fun stuff to see. <laughs> absolutely, right? Um, <laughs> and having been in, in in product development, like I've recognized that 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 that's the that's the that's the catch, right? There's it's a it's not like people come up with amazing technologies all the time. And usually the unlock for them is the commercial commercialization of them, right? Like, can you actually make this a manufacturable product or can you only make one of these, <laughs> you know, for $200,000 in a lab? Sure, it sounds amazing, but there's no audience for it. So it's not really going to move your business forward or create something that a, a, a consumer or a professional, I think that's the other side of this too, right? We, we're looking at this from like the consumer standpoint of, True. of audiophiles who are, you know, listening at home or at work and just enjoying music. But, you know, there's also a big cadre of people who need to listen to accurately reproduced audio as part of their job, whether they're in, you know, film video or in, you know, music or whatever. Like there's many times in which audio recreation at a, at a very high and precise level is, is, is a, a tool for professionals. Right. Yeah. That's a, that's a good point too. And, um, and you know, that's an interesting thought though. And, and maybe, cause again, when you talk about monitoring, we've talked about this before, I think where it's like, you know, if if you could just get the best sound, then all this high end stuff would sound the same, which isn't the case. And that that always leaves me wondering about like the monitoring stuff as well and that kind of equipment, because, again, it doesn't all sound the same. But I suppose it's just, again, different strokes for different folks and what they're looking for and what they need when they're reproducing, you know, professional audio. So that's that's an interesting lens to look at it as well, though. Um, so, so we've established, right, that these flagships are like the best that they can do and still kind of somewhat commercially market it somewhere else. Do you, so when it comes to thinking about like your Susvara versus, you know, some of the other stuff that you have, how, how do you wrap your mind around that value wise, like justifying <laughs> owning, you know, a, a several thousand dollar headphone and a chain to drive it like what's what's your what's your thoughts around that because this is kind of like i'm in the phase right now where i'm trying to like settle it, it obviously not permanently because none of us are capable of that it seems like but you know settle on what i think is kind of like my ceiling yeah for what i think is a reasonable amount of money i think that's actually a great place to start from right is like what are you willing to have in this hobby at a given point and and people, hopefully, people are less crazy than you and I in terms of how often they're swapping gear and how much gear they're keeping on hand at a given point. But you know, a lot of a lot of people in this hobby that I know follow the same path I did. They got interested in sort of maybe you know their first pair of headphones or first pair of speakers that was sort of above the really consumer grade stuff. They started researching it. They plunked down something that seemed insane to them at the time, like 150 bucks. Yo. They got, you know, a bear dynamic or whatever. They got something that was like definitely next level from like the over the ear Sony's they'd heard before and were like, whoa. And it sort of unlocked their brain. And then they just rushed down the rabbit hole and got more and more and more stuff and kept justifying a higher price tag to themselves Yo. and how much money they had in the system. And then they start selling and swapping stuff out to be able to get money back out of what they've got in it so they can try new things and, and so on and so forth and, 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 and hence the vicious cycle um, or super fun cycle, depending on where you're at. A um, little of both. A little yeah. of both. <laughs> but at some point, you, you, I think most of us step back and go, okay, let me add up everything in my rack or on my desk or in my, you know, whatever. Let me look at the headphones I have hanging up. Just do some quick back of the napkin math and you go, holy smokes, like yep. that's a insert blank, a new lawnmower, a new motorcycle, a new trip to Paris. Like, yeah, that's I just I just did that math myself, which is another reason why I wanted to have this conversation. <laughs> <clears throat> I am proud of myself, though, that I did tell my wife what that number actually was. <laughs> <laughs> did you did you move the decimal point or did you just? No, no, I kept it. I kept it legit. We both kind of <laughs> our eyes were both wide. And I said, maybe it's time to sell some, some things. <laughs> Well, that's good. That's very transparent of you. Um, I have a don't ask, don't tell policy uh, personally, <laughs> uh, although it's not it's not hard to to recognize that it's that there's a problem here. Um, but yeah, I think at some point, you know, most folks are going to go like, "What do I feel comfortable with? Like, what what feels right to me?" And then optimize back down from there. 
okay, if I can only have X dollars in my system, do I want one or more pairs of headphones? Okay, if that's the headphone or the headphones I'm committing to, then that'll inform the chain that I need in front of them to get the most out of them and so on and so forth. Or, you know, people have different ways of sort of rationalizing where they want the value within their chain. But setting a ceiling is certainly one useful tool in terms of like understanding value. And I think for me, I've gone beyond, like part of it is like I've gone beyond my ceiling. Like I feel like, right? Like I, like my audio gear significantly outvalued my vehicle, which seems, you know, ludicrous. So, um, I, how much time, how much time do you spend with your audio gear and how much time do you spend in your vehicle? Well, I spend way more time with my audio gear than vehicle when you put it like that. I only have to drive like three miles a day. So, although your vehicle uh, also has to keep your children safe in so, case that's of an true. accident. That's so. true. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I, I guess where, where I'm at is I feel like I've, I had kind of prices in mind for each piece of gear. And I think I went beyond that for every piece of gear. But part of that was just <laughs> exploration. You know, I was like, well, I want to go beyond what I'm comfortable with just to see if I really think it's worth it. And then I can make a decision. And now that I've kind of done that, I feel like, okay, I know where I want to be. And um, even if even if some of that higher end gear is maybe a little bit better performance wise, I feel like I can get what I want for less. Yeah, the unknown unknowns are are, will haunt you. Right. So the fact that you've at least tasted tasted a lot of things and, and, and tasted at the, at the very high end level informs you to say like, okay, I'm holding one pair of headphones. Like I'm, de- I have the, you know, you recently lent me the HE 1000 V2. I'm holding that in one hand, which is not an inexpensive, I mean, that's still nope. flagship. And a that lot is of, my most expensive yeah. headphone. Yeah. I'm most holding that in one hand and this is far in the other hand, which is two X on an insanely expensive headphone already going like, how can I, <laughs> how on earth can I justify this other headphone in this hand? Um, and I think part of it for me is sort of that thing I asked you about, well, how much time do you spend with it? Like part of my justification is in this time, in this place, in this post COVID or still COVID, uh, you know, pandemic world where I have a very young child, like my options for how I spend my time and my money are limited. And mm-hmm. so that's my justification. That's a very personal justification. That has very little yeah. to do with like value and more to do with like, okay, the time I'm listening, I, I want this experience. This is meaningful to me. It's, it's my, it's my special thing to myself. And at some point that will not be the case. You know, if I'm traveling more again, if I'm out in the world more again, like that will probably seem much less valuable to me. And I will probably want that money back out of the system. But as we've talked about in buying and selling gear, you know, if you can be thoughtful about what you get in for price wise and all my stuff's used. And if, you know, you recognize you'll have some depreciation and whatnot and the market's going to shift. I don't see it as like, I've spent that money and it's gone forever. I see it as like, I've spent that money. I'm continuing to rent the equipment as it devalues. Yeah. And eventually somebody in like a year, you know, who's like getting to that point is going to be really happy to have us as far at the price I'm going to be willing to get rid of it for. Yeah, so not really not really an investment, but also not just like a total money sink where the money's gone either. Like they still – everything has value, especially, you know, if you take care of it and you preserve it and, you know, you don't let your two-year-old get a hold of it. <laughs> <laughs> I know. There are risks. There are inherent risks. I always love people's posts who are like, no smoking, uh, no kids, no pets, like – I don't eat meat. Uh, you know, it's like whatever. <laughs> so, so I, yeah, I think those are all those are all fantastic points to make, and and I feel like you know, same for me is that I feel like too. What's kind of changed my thoughts here recently is I've got a couple of pieces of gear for very reasonable prices, um, and I think yeah, these this is what I want. This is what I'm enjoying right now. And just honestly, like the HE 1000, I'm like, I love that headphone, but I don't want to listen to it that much right now. So I'm like, I'll get that money back out of it. You know, it's not like they're going to be gone forever. If I want to buy another one down the road, I can. Yep. You know, so, so that's kind of the way I'm thinking about it. I think that's Um, nice. It's, It's very hard to let go sometimes in this hobby, especially when you're like 
kind of buying and selling on the used market like we are because there's this sense of scarcity and like that's often how you make the worst decisions like it's like oh, i'll never get it or i got this for such a great price i'll never get it for that price again or or what if what if i actually decide i did want to listen more to it in a couple months just because i'm not into it right this second um and that does happen there's headphones that i put up on a shelf for a while and then come back to and been like i love this headphone why haven't i been listening to this more um but yeah i did a pretty big sell-off of a lot of gear um, to focus on a single chain. And that's that was like my first decision about what I wanted to do with the money that I had in this hobby was focus. Like that that was the value creating I wanted to do. I wanted to sort of eke the most out of basically a single system. Um, and that's why I've, I've stuck with this as far as is like I haven't heard anything that best them, Yeah. period. So it's yeah. like if I'm going to have a single chain and really have fun optimizing that chain the thing at the end of it has to be in my mind, the best thing. Um, so that I know as I'm tweaking, you know, up the chain, I'm going to realize those results. But you know, if somebody came to me in tomorrow and said like, look, whatever, uh, we need, you need money to do something else important. You can only have an X dollar system on your desk. Like I, I don't think I'd be crushed. I think I'd enjoy the challenge of like trying to optimize into that system um, I'm playing a different game right now, which is like, I still have a ceiling, right? <laughs> yeah. You know, there, there are, you know, $20,000 headphone amps. I'm not buying a $20,000 headphone amp. Like I have an insane amount of money in this, in this rack right now, but I, everyone has a limit <laughs> at some point. You know, I'm going to go back to that. The, the enjoyment of trying to fit into a certain budget. And I think that's really what, that's really one of the things that drives me and my interest in the hobby, mm -hmm. honestly, is because I kind of have different like price points in my head. And I'm like, okay, what's the best thousand dollar system I can build? What's the best $500 system I can build? What's the best, you know, $200 system? And you can kind of just play around with like, well, if somebody was going to come to me and say they had, 300 bucks to spend the these these are the options that i would lay out for them and i kind of like just having that inventory of options in my head and i think that is a lot of fun to think about like high value like price point systems yeah. uh, that's just something that i enjoy doing and i think you know right now i've got like the two pieces of gear that really made me um kind of do a 180 from the he 1000 um and again, not that I don't like the HE-1000. I love that headphone. But I got these 8XXs, and they were like 650 bucks, which I know sounds like a lot to to some people still. And it is a lot for a set of headphones. But I'm like, what these can do for that amount of money with my $500 used Felix Audio Echo that I've got? And I'm like, that's a, I, it's great audio and it's like almost under a thousand dollars for those yeah. two things. You yeah, know? that's and great. I'm going, I'm going like, I don't think I can beat it. I don't think I can beat it. And I don't think I can justify owning more, yeah. you know, at, at this point. And that's my budget. You know, that's my, that's where I want to be. I feel like for me, it's about like five, 600 bucks for every piece of gear in the chain is kind of where I'm like, that seems not too crazy to me. Mm -hmm. You know, and I feel like I'm almost there. I still, my DAC is still a little bit more than all that, but you know, I'll experiment some more. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I think, I think that's a very reasonable price point to play. And I think if somebody said, could I build a system that I'd like genuinely love and not sort of like nitpick faults on, on a daily basis? Like if they said you have 300 bucks to do it, I'd be like, maybe, I, I don't know. <laughs> 500 probably like a thousand bucks i think you could build a kick-ass system for a thousand bucks like after that i do believe that you like the law of diminishing returns starts multiplying really fast um or unmultiplying i don't know you you're the teacher you tell me but <laughs> yeah i don't know dividing <laughs> dividing dividing quickly right? factoring uh, i don't know <laughs> exactly um but yeah i, th I think and, and there is sort of a there's i think we've tried to like i've tried to draw that graph in my head there's like a point where like to make a thing for that amount of money, there's going to be so many corners cut that you're just not there yet. Right. It's like, you're like talking about, and, and it's not that there aren't good, like $50 headphones for what they're built to do. Yeah. But when you're getting into this game, when you're, if you're listening to us talk about this, you're obviously, <laughs> you've you're already in. fallen off the wagon. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I think there's a, 
is a point at that like hundred fifty dollar ab- above mark on a pair of headphones where you start to get into the like mind blown territory of like I didn't know things could sound like this, and then and then it keeps going for a while, but it, it does it does start to taper for me probably around five six hundred bucks, and then it's it. It's not that the graph isn't going up. It just starts to go up so much slower and even sort of falter. <laughs> you know, I feel like it yeah, It yeah. almost flatlines and then maybe it picks back up for me at the like really crazy high end stuff. But then you've also just got taste as such a factor at that point. I can't genuinely say a lot of that stuff is like better. It's almost just taste. Well, and I think too, yeah, it's like whenever I really start to question it is when I kind of A-B stuff and I'm going – can I really hear a difference? Like, is it like I question myself? I'm mm-hmm. not like instantly like, oh yeah, like that's okay. You I think know, that's uh, a really good measure of value, right? If you if you switch from one DAC or one amp or one pair of headphones to another, you should go like, oh damn. Like that's my opinion. Like I want to hear that. If I don't hear that, then you haven't created value for me, no matter what the price delta is. Like I want I, I want a difference. I want to hear something notable. I, I do feel I do feel like there should be an asterisk there though in that a lot of times with some of this stuff like the the improvements are so nuanced that you do need to acclimate to them you know what I mean like a lot of times a sudden a b isn't gonna like yeah let you see the whole picture so just I mean I agree that you should be able to hear a difference and like that should be a factor but like I was just for instance listening um last night and I was given I'm given another 6 series Sennheiser chance so I got an HD 600 that I picked up that's like the only one I haven't heard yet and um I I settled into it for a good hour and by the time that hour was done I could see its merits you know yeah. what I mean but I think too like just speaking to like once you get to the 5 600 dollar range you know th- how things are are looking pretty good I think with those lower value headphones for me they're just less consistent right like you can listen to a sundara or an hd 600 or something along those lines right and you'll say that's good that song's good but then you'll hit one and you go oh i don't know that one's great on me a little bit whereas just like i feel like as you move up in value some of those rough edges get smoothed out a little bit more to where it's not as genre dependent necessarily or track to track dependent like you can just or maybe that's maybe that's just my piece of value is like i'm looking for a headphone where like i don't feel like it grates on me in a lot of scenarios you know i think that's an interesting interesting point though because i think that's an argument that a lot of people you know make to themselves about why they have multiple pairs of headphones right it's like oh this is like my jazz headphone (laughs) yeah this is like my hard rock headphone this one sounds awesome with like sort of more producer oriented music. And and I think you're right that as you move up the chain you will find less compromises. Um will you yes. still find one headphone that does everything probably not. equally good? Probably not. Or does everything to your taste, right? It's like I don't so, want a flat, you know, response with certain kinds of music. I want a heavy V shape or you know, like but that's to my taste. That's uh, that's a, a a layer I'm putting on the original artist's yeah, intent so, or whatever. So is it more valuable to have a $600 pair of headphones that's less compromising or to have three $200 headphones that fit three different niches for you? I don't know. I think that's that's totally personal, right? That's yeah, not totally how you like personal. to listen. Yeah, yeah, totally personal way to think about it. Um, what do you think – I mean as far as, as far as going up in price on things and the value of different pieces in the chain – I mean, where do you, do you feel like certain pieces of gear have more diminishing return than others? You know, amps, DAX, tube amps versus solid state. Do you do you have any thoughts on any of that? Any of that stuff as far as as far as it goes? I don't feel like I've really. I, I at first, if you would asked me two years ago, I would have said DAX would have been, but I don't know now that now that my DAC is the most expensive thing in my chain, and I'm going, it matters. <laughs> Yeah. You know what I mean? Like I, I'm with you. I think I used to kind of poo-poo the importance of, of a DAC a little bit. Um, but I think that was also because I was listening to a lot of less expensive gear. Yeah. And I don't think that a lot of three hundred dollar pair of headphones and two hundred dollar little desktop amps right. are gonna let you really unpack what a high quality DAC is offering. 
That's an inter- that's an interesting thought right there. Cause yeah, if you say say you're using a set of two hundred dollar headphones and you're using a two hundred dollar amp and then you go buy a thousand dollar DAC. Yeah. You, you might not even notice a difference. That's why I think that's why I look a little bit about what's the total spend for the system. Yeah. I mean, you know, you were sort of saying like five hundred, five hundred, five hundred is like one way to think about it. And I think that is probably at that at, at like fifteen hundred bucks as a total system, that that probably might be a good way to divide the spend. Um, but if you're spending like, I don't know, 300 bucks, I don't like, don't like, you're not going to dunk it a DAC. Like that's not a worthwhile part of your system at that point. And I don't know, I think you could, you could play with the ratios of the yeah. total system expenditure, depending on, on what, what you're at. But yeah, now that I've listened to some really, really high end DACs on some really good gear, it's like, yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of night and day when you go between between DAX and you're like, oh, that is having a huge influence on my listening experience, but huge. I don't know. I mean, not really. <laughs> but, yeah, huge, <laughs> huge is, huge is relative. We, huge is a lot relative. of, I, I think, and that's maybe, maybe that has a perceived, I, I don't know. I, I'm thinking there's just kind of like, how do I want to put this? I don't know. It's not misinformation, but just the communication isn't always great between people like us that listen to tons of stuff and we might use hyperbole to get a point across, you know, when (laughs) the realities are not like, yeah, if you, if you, like we said, if we a B, you know, like a, like a $300 DAC to a thousand dollar DAC, it might not be like night and day, but to us, we might say, well, if you really pay attention to it, the differences are pretty large, you know, but, People yep. are using huge, you know, destroys it, blah, blah, blah. And, that, <laughs> it's, and like, it's like, no, maybe no. we're setting the expectations a little too high for some of that stuff as well. Yeah. I know I feel like I've fallen into that trap before, at least, where like people have said, oh, you know, this is the greatest thing or blah, blah, blah. And then I listen to it and it's just like it was just typed too much. Yeah. You know? You're like, well, that was a little better. I'm not going to argue with you. Yeah, it was I'm like, a little oh, better. Yeah, it's better, maybe. <laughs> I think. Yeah. I don't know. I think, though, maybe, though, it's interesting. You, you know, you've ended up with the DAC as one of the most expensive things in your chain. And, and maybe the thing I'm reading between the lines, it seems like you're maybe the most reluctant to to downgrade from. Or, you know, maybe you'll find something that you love. But I, I, I think... just haven't found I just haven't found another one that I like as much, you know, whereas like with the amps and stuff, like I have a more expensive amp and then I, I got this. You know, this cheaper tube amp. And plus, I'm starting to go down the tube rabbit hole here, which is a fun rabbit hole, but also... Welcome to my world. (laughs) Yeah. Also, um, you know, different as far as just expectations and things go with dealing with that gear. But but I think I haven't... Like, so the Socrus 2541 is the DAC that I have now. You know, like a $1,200 DAC or something like that, right? And I just... I love it, (laughs) you know? And I don't want to have a $1,200 DAC, but I'm like... If I'm going to go back down in price, I got to find something that I like as much. And I haven't. Here's yet. the thing that I think is you interesting know? about about where you've ended up, right? Is that, and, and I feel sort of similarly, if I were going to downgrade a bunch of my equipment, the DAC might be one of the last things I downgrade because having tried a bunch of them and understanding what they do to the chain, it's like, I that's the part. Like, that's really a lot of where the magic happens is like, what do you, how are you turning those ones and zeros into uh, audio signal? And you can't, like, if that, if you don't like that, everything that comes after it is going to suffer from it. And again, if you're in like gear where it's like, you're not playing in those nuances, then it kind of doesn't matter. But knowing that I might not love my downgrade or I might end up going up in other places, I don't know. I feel like that's that's probably like I'd keep a really good DAC and then I'd probably, I'd probably my, uh, you know, headphones and, and, and incredibly powerful amp to drive them would go. And that would free up a ton of money. And, you know, there's a lot of amps I've liked that are much cheaper. A lot of headphones I've liked that are much cheaper. And that's probably where I'd actually end up. Um, So, yeah, DAX. Going back. Plus, I feel like like amps and headphones, too, have a lot of flavor, right? So there's a lot more room for preference there. A DAC, I don't feel like is so much like the flavor. It really is more of a technical thing at the DAC level. Do you think, or am I, maybe I'm not. I don't know. I, I feel I like know. there's, it, there's definitely DACs of that flavor, usually not in a great way. Like I'd like a somewhat even keeled response, but yeah, 
I don't know, maybe, yeah, maybe flavor is, is sort of the loaded word here because like really good Ardar ladder dacks that I've tried have just the most beautiful decay, right? They're just notes stretch out. They end so naturally. They can come in with impact and that leading edge can be well-defined, but it doesn't feel like false or propped up. There's space between things because there's space between them in the recording, not because an algorithm is saying like, oh, people think things sound more high end when I take it apart and like add gaps in between. Like there's just, I don't know. See, it's like, me, it's very I, to like me, hard though, to, I don't, uh, to take that I, apart. I, I don't know. To me, I don't feel like that's really flavor though. To me, I feel like that's just like yeah. capturing the recording properly. Yeah. You know, yeah. you know what I mean? Whereas like a tube amp, you know, that's some flavor, right? Like you're adding flavor there to it and headphones, you know, they have their own little flavor yeah. they're adding to it. But, like, for me, the DAC is, like, uh, again, like you're talking about, if you don't have it there, you know, nothing after that can create it. Yeah. Like, yeah, I, I I do agree with you. I think if, you, if we're thinking about flavor in terms of, like, oh, a headphone is V-shaped or U-shaped or has a flat response or whatnot or emphasizes this or that. Yeah, ho- yeah. hopefully good quality DACs aren't adding too much of their own tuning, right, their own emphasis on anything. They're going to somewhat, right? It's like it's it's a process. It You're converting yeah, it has to. data to to waveform, so it's like it's going to happen a little bit. But yeah, I'm with you. But still, there's something that like two DACs at similar price points doing si- using similar technologies. One I'll still like more than the sure. other. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, no, for sure. some reasons, you for know. For some reason, yeah, yeah. For some reason, I agree. I agree. It so all there's matters. preference. Maybe there's less flavor. It, it all matters know. to certain extent right yeah. like i don't feel like there's any part of the chain where you can be like oh just get whatever it's not gonna it's sure. not gonna matter i feel like it's all and again even like all the hundred to two hundred dollar thx amps mm-hmm. you know they don't all sound exactly the same they just don't no they really and, don't and so i mean i i just think again i my personal way to do things in this hobby is i almost always have to have at least two of one thing so i can try them and then i can just pick one and then i don't question it as much or at least it buys me some time until i start questioning it again (laughs) that's actually that is a a good way to think about value is like whether you have the means or not to get your hands on multiple of a thing you know like find like people in this community are super friendly like people like lend me gear not because i do reviews but because they're nice and i lend you know so it's like there's meetups there's a lot of opportunities to try stuff and i think that's like people may feel a little siloed in this, in this hobby that like, Oh, they're like in their home office or their bedroom or whatever, like on YouTube looking at this stuff. And they're just like, ah, I'm never going to get to try that. And you get all this FOMA. I'd say, I don't know. I, I would try to get over that hump. I think there are typically in most major metros, there's good meetups, there's good communities, there's Facebook groups, there's obviously, you know, head and all the other communities, like reach out to people, like try, well, do a swap, do a loan, rent something from somebody, you know, but yeah, try stuff because that's the way to understand where you're, where you're going to draw your line on value. And get it, get involved and be willing to share as well. Right. Like you can't just come in as a stranger and be like, Hey, somebody loaned me this thousand dollar set of headphones. <laughs> like yeah. nobody's going to go for that. But if you, you know, if you're working with people, if you're communicating with people, doing a little bit of trading, you know, I, I, there's several people anymore that I just trade with. We don't even sell to each other, you know, just, just, Hey, you send me this, I'll send you this, you know, yeah. we'll swap back in a couple of weeks, yeah. whatever. And that's again, for me, this hobby. And I may have mentioned this at some point in the past, but there is, I always go back to this American pick, this American pickers episode where one of the guys was like, you know, the goal is to play with all the toys in the world, not to own all the toys in the world. And that's how I, you know, approach this hobby. And that's why I think like, you know, any of the headphones that I have on hand right now, it's not that those are the headphones I want. It's just, that's what I'm playing with right now. Yeah. And then I'll sell them or trade them so I can play with something else. Well, so how do you, how do you uh, reconcile that with sort of this idea of narrowing down the collection, narrowing down to stuff that really has good value for dollar in your mind? Yeah, I think, well, for me, it's like, I have my best stuff that I like. Like, this is what I'm really enjoying. This is what, like, I'm comparing against. And then, so I kind of, in my head, I guess I have, like, like front runners. Mm-hmm. And then it's, it's like they're there until something comes in and overtakes them. Whether it overtakes them because they're just better or because they're a better value in my mind 
or because my mood changes. Mm -hmm. I don't know. You know, there's stuff like, um, like I said, 8XX is just my favorite headphone right now. Like I'm just really enjoying it um, from, and, and in all sorts of situations, right? So in my head, I'm going, this is the headphone that I just want to listen to right now. So yeah. it doesn't make sense for me to keep another set of $2,000 headphones if I have a $650 set that I want to listen to. Yeah. And, you know, but I reviewed an 800S a couple of months ago and I was like, eh. Right. You know, at the time I was like, I I don't know, it wasn't doing it for me. So whether it's my preferences change, my source gear has changed, whether it's just because I bought this set for so cheap in my mind, yeah. you know, that's to me, I can just enjoy things more if I'm like, I know I got a good deal on it. And then I'm like, I'm not sitting here going, oh, I got too much money invested in that. You know, I'm yeah. not listening to it enough. Yeah. It just, it takes some of those nitpicks off my brain. Yeah. Well, you know, we've probably touched on this before, but it's like this, this should bring you joy, right? This should bring, like, bring you closer right. to the music and be, I mean, sure, there's the technical side. It's fun to swap things and hear the differences and all that. But at the end of the day, of the day this entire hobby should be bringing you joy. And if you're like stressing out because you've got too much money in your gear or you got to put something on that you don't want to put on because you feel like you should like it because you spent yeah. a bunch of money on it. Like those are all like, that's a, you got to check yourself on that stuff. Like time to not, make a change. Time to make yeah. a change. Yeah. Time that's, to make a change. We all bought stuff we don't end up liking. We've all got followed some hype train that led us down the wrong path. It's like that stuff happens, but like, and moods change, whatever, you know, if you don't, if you don't sit down to listen and go like, I love that piece. I love this piece. This sounds great. I'm super happy with the sound. Like, if you got other things nagging you and freaking you out about it, it's just not worth it. It's not. Yeah, it's not. You're it's right. Not worth it. And that's that's probably the biggest lesson, really, for all of it. Honestly, is yeah. If you got any, if you got too many things nagging at you, make a change. No, yeah. there's no rules, right? There's no rules to it. There's no rules, and I think that's one of the big problems with this hobby is people act like there's rules. Oh, you didn't like that headphone? Like you're wrong. It's like you didn't like that. Yeah. You don't think that amp is the best pairing with that thing? You're wrong. Like, oh, yeah, you haven't actually the heard most this. Most money on a DAC? That's not. No, yeah. that's dumb. Yeah, yeah, no, there's no rules. There's no <laughs> there's rules. No rules. Don't, don't believe anyone that says you are enjoying this. You're wrong. Like that's never the case. <laughs> the only way to be right in this in this hobby is to be listening to something that's that's bringing you joy. So it doesn't matter if it's terribly inaccurate, has a wacky sound signature. If it speaks to you then it's your jam. Like, great, value-driven. Like, and some things, like, you paid full retail for a thing, but it makes you super happy, great. Like, no rules. Like, whatever makes you happy at the end of the day, and you can afford without going into credit card debt, <laughs> I would say, is a yeah. reasonable place to be. I. Th that's it. I think we end it there. That's perfect. All right. Sounds good. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody. Um, who knows when the next one will be? <laughs> Hopefully, we'll try to do... Hopefully we'll try to do one a little bit sooner next time around, but you know, yeah. we, we got stuff going on too. So we'll, we'll just do it as we can kind of think up fun ideas for conversations, I think. Yeah. And if you, if you have any ideas, very much welcome. Got some, some nice comments back last time that were very helpful and encouraging and good questions. So, uh, these do get posted to YouTube, but they're also available as just pure audio, uh, podcasts. If, if that's easier for you. Uh, to listen to something as, as you commute or whatnot. So we'll, we'll put links for all that stuff in the description. Yeah. And feel free to add to the discussion, right? If you have some thoughts on value or where how you think about it or what great pieces of gear you think are, you know, excellent values, drop all that stuff in comments or, or you know, shoot us an email and share those thoughts and maybe we'll talk about them next time around, something like that. Yep, sounds great. Thanks, guys. All right. Thanks, everybody. See ya.